sagen. So, 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 so. All right, let's get started. What we're going to talk about today is place. Mint. Mint. Last time we talked about price in. Right. So the marketing mix consists of product, promotion, price, and place. Those are the four P's. We refer to that as the marketing mix. So today what we're going to talk about is place. We're going to talk about marketing channels, channels of distribution, if you will. So I want to start our discussion by seeing if you can identify different channels of distribution. After we do that, then we're going to talk about different retailers that are in those channels of distribution. But first I want to identify the different channels of distribution and different types of retailers. Then we're going to look at some examples. We're going to, then we'll talk about specific retailers. But first let's talk about the different channels of distribution. What are they? What are some of the different um, channels of distribution? Um, wholesale, right? So as part of the value chain, we have processors, we have manufacturers, we have wholesalers and distributors, retailers, and the end user. So when we talk about some of the retailers, for example, what are some of the different types of retailers? What are different types of retailers? We're going to talk about the names of certain retailers, but before we could get to that, let's talk about how we classify those retailers. So, for example, how about mass merchants? Sometimes we refer to that channel of trade as discounters. So, mass merchants or discounters, that's an example of a channel of distribution. Department stores is another channel of distribution, another type of retailer. Grocery stores, drug stores, wholesale clubs, specialty stores, Those are all examples of channels of distribution. Those are all different types of retailers. So when we think about how we're going to sell our good, how we're going to sell, whether it's a consumable or a durable good, we have to think about what channel of distribution, what types of retailers are we going to try and sell our goods? And our distribution strategy, if we think of our distribution strategy on a continuum, it could be from intensive to exclusive. And somewhere in between would be selective. So when we think about how many different places, how many different channels, how many different retailers we want to sell our goods, that's the way that we would classify the level of intensity as it relates to distribution. So in other words, when we talk about intensive distribution, so our distribution strategy might be intensive. If our distribution strategy is intensive, like it suggests here, then what that means is that our goal is to sell our goods everywhere, so to speak. So at every retailer, in every channel of distribution, now, it's not enough for us to have that 
as a goal to say that our distribution strategy um, is intensive, it's got to be something that's achievable. So if we say that we want to be um, able to implement a strategy, a distribution strategy that's intensive, it's got to be that those channels of distribution are relevant to our product. So there's got to be a match. It's got to be, there's got to be a logical association. So for example, what do you think if we said, well, yes, um, I want to have an intensive distribution strategy and our company sells sneakers. And you say, yeah, all those that you mentioned, mass merchants, department stores, grocery stores, specialty stores, wholesale clubs, drug stores, convenience stores, I want to sell sneakers in all of those types of retailers, in all of those channels. Do you think that's something that's appropriate, that's realistic? What do you think, Jacob? So for sneakers, you might not want to put it in like a pharmacy or someplace that's uh, not fitting for your product. Yeah, so there's a disconnect there that typically um, you don't buy sneakers in drug stores or grocery stores. Maybe a selective distribution strategy is more appropriate which would suggest that, yeah, you're right, coach, let's leave those out. So we'll scratch convenience stores, drug stores, and grocery stores from the list, and the others um, we feel are appropriate for our product. They're, they're relevant to that channel of distribution. So instead of intensive, our distribution strategy would be selective. And the other extreme would be if our strategy was exclusive, which would mean that we're only going to sell our goods at specialty stores, or maybe only at company stores, our company-owned stores. So that's something strategically we need to decide. Is our distribution strategy going to be Intensive, selective, or exclusive. So what would be an example of an exclusive distribution strategy that we've seen in the marketplace? What do you think would be a good example? Now sometimes it's, it's not uncommon, in fact it's become more common actually for companies to give certain channels of distribution what we call a lead launch. So in order to establish a higher perceived value in the marketplace, for example, it's common that manufacturers for a given product will sell the product first in department stores. So they might give them an exclusive for the limited period of time, sometimes six months, for example, and then after that period of time is expired, then sell it in specialty stores, and then discount stores. But that being said, what are some examples, or let's, let's see if we can have one example of an exclusive distribution arrangement. Go ahead. The medicines and the pharmacies. So tell us about that. Explain. Okay. The medicines are exclusive to be selling pharmacies. So that for prescription medications, that you can't get it at a department store, but what about, that's actually an interesting example because, um, for example, discounters very often have a pharmacy within their store, 
See, they understand that um, that's going to drive foot traffic to their establishment. And also grocery stores also very often have a pharmacy within um, their store. So, but that being said, from a manufacturer standpoint, from a pharmaceutical standpoint, you could still argue that, well, it's still we're selling to the pharmacy within that store, and that's a type of exclusive um, distribution strategy, even though it's basically a store within a store, which has become more and more common. What's driving this store within a store approach to retailing? Why has that become so um, common. So, for example, at Macy's, Macy's um, at Herald Square in Manhattan, they have quite a few um, stores within the store. Why is that? They have um, Starbucks there. In fact, they have quite a few Starbucks in Macy's. And even, for example, the Ralph Lauren section is really a store within a store. Tommy Hilfiger is a store within a store. The cosmetics counters, for example, are also <coughs> examples of um, stores within a store. What, why is that? What is it that, from a business strategy, Macy's is trying to achieve? Yeah, you have a lot of different um, stores that are all in the same category in the same place, and you can get more, um, I mean it makes more sense to have everything all in the same place, rather than have a separate store here and a separate store there. Oh, absolutely. So Macy's is a department store, absolutely. That's part of their value proposition. So um, Kevin is saying that, um, yeah, instead of going to a specialty store, come to Macy's. We've got cosmetics, we've got sneakers, we've got shoes, we've got shirts, pants. So that's part of, absolutely part of the appeal of that channel of distribution. But from a merchandising standpoint and also an inventory standpoint, so what Macy's is trying to do is effectively manage inventory and also the risk associated with operating a coffee shop within their building. So why would you why would you want to um, you know um, do that when an alternative approach is to have these type of concessions, right? So you have a counter, and the it's a Lancome counter, for example, or it's the Bobby Brown um, counter, and so those organizations pay Macy's for that space. So instead of Macy's taking all this inventory in, and then if it doesn't sell, then basically they're stuck with the merchandise. Although, of course, most uh, manufacturers have return policies and so forth, but wouldn't it be better to rent that space to them? So rent a portion of the counter to these different Cosmetics companies. Could it be similar to bartering also? What was that? Could it be similar to bartering? Well, in this case, it's it's not bartering, but um, I, I see the um, the connection you're trying to draw. But that's in this particular um, situation, um, that's not the case. So what they're trying to do is have um, a way for them to reduce the amount of cash that they tie up in inventory and also the risk associated with the inventory not selling. And also minimize the amount of employees that they need to hire to um, run the business. So for example, very often the, um, the staff is not employed by Macy's. In some cases, the, um, the staff is employed by the 
um, the manufacturer or the, or the marketing organization. So for example, when, um, when you go to Starbucks there and you get a receipt, what do you think it says? Does it say Macy's or does it say Starbucks? Starbucks. Yeah, so in that situation, um, it says Starbucks. So what about, so Alan raised a good point, this idea of selling exclusively to pharmacies. But we saw it's not as easy as it seems because there's very often pharmacies within different channels of distribution. What about the iPhone? Did Apple have an e exclusive distribution arrangement with AT&T? Do you think that's a good example of they could have um, sold iPhones in mass merchants, right? Mass merchants like um, Walmart, they sell phones. Um, specialty stores like Best Buy, they sell phones. Sprint sells phones. Verizon sells phones. But who could tell us more about their distribution strategy? What was the distribution strategy for the iPhone? What did Apple decide? What was their approach? They only use AT&T as their provider to, uh, um, if anyone wanted the iPhone, so they had to have the AT&T service so they could use their phone. And then only after, I think it was like six years or something, and they, were, and they um, allowed Verizon to also um, be able to distribute the uh, iPhone. So the people, it's great for AT&T because anyone that wanted the iPhone switched to their network. And so there's something in it for, um, for AT&T, right. absolutely. Even it's definitely a benefit to AT&T for being the exclusive distributor of the iPhone. But right. because even though like uh, Verizon now has their phone, people are so like, used to their AT&T service or they're happy with it, they're not complaining, so they're not going to switch back to Verizon. So they just gain like a bunch of customers from that. Um, and what's the benefit for, so for AT&T, it's a great, um, a great deal because they have the um, most innovative new phone, right? The most innovative phone um, on the market. And if wireless um, customers want the iPhone, they have to have AT&T wireless service. So it sounds like a, a great uh, partnership from their perspective. What about, tell us about from the perspective of Apple, why is it a good thing for them? Why would they say, why would they not say, we're coming out with, a, with the iPhone and we're going to sell it at AT&T, of course, and also at Verizon and Sprint and, and other places? If it, if it becomes like exclusive, I think people want it more in general. Like if people can't get it everywhere, that's the point. Like you want something like that. You want an item that... Most people can't get just anywhere on any on the street or whatever, and you have to um, be like a be like an exclusive like member in like a club, or whatever, to be able to get like an item. So that um, so creates people, um, some appeal, yeah, right? That people talk about it, and also Apple gets gets paid a lot from AT and T. Like in order to have a deal, AT and T paid a lot to Apple. So tell us, tell us about that. How does, how does that work? What is it that they... If AT&T wants the, wants the iPhone exclusively, they have to pay, I don't know how many millions to Apple. So. And so there's um, an advantage if you, if you put the um, idea on the table of giving an exclusive, then isn't it reasonable that you would expect to, that because like um, Jonathan said, because it's so advantageous to AT&T that there's, um, they should expect that they would have to pay Apple to have that exclusive arrangement. When you sign a two-year agreement at, for AT&T wireless service, you could 
get um, an iPhone for $200. How much does the phone actually sell for? What is the, if you're buying the, if you had to pay $200 for the phone at the AT&T store when you sign the two-year agreement, what is the actual price of the phone? $650. Yeah, it's um, approximately $600. So, who do you think is paying the difference? Who, who has the greater incentive? The carrier. The carrier, right? Uh, because they don't expect to make money on the phones. In fact, on not just the iPhone, but on every phone. Some of the phones they give you for free. They say, we'll give you a phone. Is it really? People I don't get it. Because what, there's, what they want to sell is the service. They want to sell the wireless service. And if they have to, if you don't have wireless service now, then they'll even give you a phone. Nothing's free right? tonight. Right. There's, no, there's no free lunch. But, so there's an incentive for them. They're thinking long term. They're saying, we'll give you the phone for free and um, you sign a contract with us that we'll get, provide you the wireless service. <coughs> What's another, if we have some insight about the industry dynamics, <coughs> what's the appeal to partnering with AT&T? Yeah, Jason. Um, if Apple gives AT&T their product, it's another shelf space that they are opportunity to sell their product and make more sales. As opposed to if it's just selling in an Apple store, people have to come to Apple and then get the service, whereas it's direct, it's direct to serve the product and the service together. Or like, like bundling, I guess? Co-branding. Oh, Co-branding, yeah. So, so tell us more about that. So why AT&T, though? Why don't you, um, you co-brand then, if that's what you're going to do with, um, with Verizon? Why AT&T? What do we know about the market dynamics in wireless communication. Well, first of all, we know that the wireless communication market in the United States is very highly concentrated, which means that there's only a few wireless carrier providers that control literally 90% of the market. And AT&T is one of the largest. AT&T is actually the largest. In fact, at the time, they had about 50 million subscribers. So that was one of the, it wasn't that they just randomly picked a provider, they wanted to partner with the largest provider of wireless communication in the United States, and the expectation is that a large percentage of them, this was their um, hope, would trade up to the iPhone. And, as Jonathan was suggesting, that AT&T, being a very well-established, respected, and prominent wireless communication carrier, would also be able to steal customers from their competitors. So the thought is that if you want the iPhone, the thought is that they would switch from Verizon or Sprint. At $600, you're not going to sell everybody. Remember we talked about the diffusion of innovation model. Everett Rogers, he says that the innovators are about 3% of the market. So they didn't think, even if we said, okay, it's going to be intensive. We're going to sell iPhones everywhere. But I mean, how many people realistically, even in the United States, where the per capita income is very high relative to other markets around the world, how many iPhones are you going to sell? Even the, with a population that's 300 million, which, by the way, the U.S. only represents 5% of the world population. So you think 300 million is a lot? That's only 5% of the world's population. In China, there's 1 billion 300 million people. So China is 
the most populated. India is the second most populated. India also has um, a bit more than a billion people. So realizing that they wouldn't be able to sell the entire market, initially, they thought it was realistic to assume that partnering with and giving an exclusive to the leading wireless service provider was the best thing to do because they would have access to the 50 million subscribers that AT&T currently had and that people who didn't have AT&T service, that those innovators or those early adopters who were willing to pay a premium for the phone would also be willing to switch carriers. I mean, it's not crazy to think, oh, you're going to switch from Sprint to Verizon or Verizon to AT&T. <coughs> is it? I mean, is that like a unheard of phenomenon? No, it happens. Sometimes if you break the contract, you have to pay a fee. Sometimes it's, what, $50 or $150? It depends, but if, if you really want the iPhone, they thought that that wouldn't be a deterrent. That wouldn't be a reason because it's not distributed at Verizon. They said, well, we're not really taking that much of a risk. We're not going to sell everybody right away anyway. So we'll give an exclusive to AT&T. It'll be a win-win partnership. We'll certainly have access to their already very significant installed base. We usually refer to that as an installed base. They're existing customers, which we said is about, at that time, was about 50 million. And those who are Sprint and Verizon customers who really want the iPhone, they'll switch. So that's a good example of exclusive distribution. So let's go back now. We talked about, we identified some of the channels of distribution, some of the types of retailers. Who could tell us what they are? What are some of the types of retailers that we identified so far? And then we'll talk about the names of some of those. But let's go back now and recap. Who could tell us what are some of the channels of distribution? What are some of the types of retailers that we identified? Who so? You're st sticking with that answer, huh? Mass merchants. <laughs> yeah, I think mass merchants. We said also known as uh, discounters. Department stores. Department stores. Somebody. Retailers. Specialty, Specialty stores. Grocery, Grocery stores. Grocery. Drug stores, wholesale. Con wholesale clubs, convenience stores. So now let's see, can we come up with the names of some retailers in those categories? Costco, the wholesalers, wholesale clubs. Okay, so for wholesale clubs, we have Costco. Walmart, what else? What else? Well, let's see. Who else is, who are some of the other competitors in wholesale clubs? Sam's, Sam's, Sam's Club. Club. Sam's Club? BJ's. BJ's? So... In the United States, those are the three key <coughs> wholesale clubs. BJ's, Costco's, and Sam's Club. What's unique about that channel of distribution? Because remember, we said, now we need to think about if we're going to sell our products at Costco or Sam's Club, whether or not that makes sense. So what is unique about that retail format? Because there's a reason why we classify <coughs> those channels that way. Obviously, there's some differences amongst them. So what is it about wholesale clubs that makes them unique relative to discount stores and specialty stores and so on? Um, it's a lot of like business to business for them. No. They're, pro they're selling to, since they have like mass um, products, you know, they're selling to other businesses a lot of times. <clears throat> so sometimes um, businesses shop there. They, um, because uh, what Jonathan is saying is they sell in bulk. So it's not in a quantity that um, maybe that the average family would need. But if you have an office, then maybe you buy 
three million staples. <laughs> right, three million staples, you might. Exactly. The average person, um, you wouldn't think would need that many staples. At least not within the course of a decade. But um, if you have uh, 50 people in your office, then you might. What else? So they do sell in bulk, but is it just business to business or do they also sell to consumers? They do sell to consumers. Consumers shop there and they buy in bulk certain items. Don't they have a membership? You have to pay a membership, which is um, about $50 per year. And the thought is that they sell these products in bulk and they're at a discount relative to what you would pay in other channels of distribution. So they sell um, cashews, for example, but you have to buy it in a big jar, which might be um, $20. Where maybe in some other channels you buy just a small jar at uh, maybe at a discounter that's maybe only $3. So you have to ask yourself, well, you buy this big jar, I mean, who's, are you gonna, who's gonna eat all that? Maybe if you have, if you really, your family really likes cashews and, um, you know, you're married and you have eight kids, then maybe it makes sense. Or cereal, for example. So they sell, um, very large boxes of cereal. In fact, it's, um, there's like two bags inside the box. Family size. Exactly, it's family size. And they have a whole range of um, products, but like Jonathan is saying, the key is that it's sold in bulk, large quantities, whatever it is. You know, like normally you think, oh, you buy a little pack of M&Ms? Yeah, there they sell, you know, like these big bags of M&Ms. Everything you pick up there is, at a minimum, is like eight ninety eight. You don't need a bag for anything this time. Yeah, usually, yeah, you don't. You want to get a can of soup? Well, you can't just buy one can. You have to buy six cans. Six cans are seven ninety nine. Then that's all six cans of chicken noodle soup. And you think, well, but if you have a big family, then. So maybe that makes sense. Maybe that's what we're sitting here, we think, oh, that sounds like a lot. Maybe that um, will go very quickly in a big household. So certainly bulk is um, a key part of the way that um, they stock their store. They sell products in bulk. <coughs> Not every item is in bulk. So. They sell, you could buy a pair of pants there. But usually, um, like Jonathan is saying, everything is in a, um, everything is like supersized quantity. So you buy laundry detergent, you know, it's not one of these like 18 ounce things of laundry detergent. It's a big, like 96 ounce um, container of laundry detergent. What about mass merchants? Who are some of the key discounters in the United States? So an example of a mass merchant would be Walmart. Walmart is the world's largest retailer. Obviously the, you know, the largest retailer in the United States. And they're considered to be a discounter, mass merchant if you will, Kmart, is also classified as a mass merchant. Target is also a mass merchant. How is their business model different from Costco, for example? So from wholesale clubs. No, there's no like, membership fee? There's certainly, there's definitely no membership fee. And the price is um, equivalent, I would say. Maybe uh, wholesale clubs are less per ounce or per pound, but 
Um, certainly mass merchants, discounters, have what we call an EDLP approach to retailing, which is everyday low price. Right, so at Walmart, they don't run sales per se. Sometimes they uh, mark things down. Part of their um, strategy, their retail strategy, is that they focus on rollbacks. So after the product is in the store for a certain period of time, like let's say a year, and they reset the planogram, the planogram is that standardized layout for their stores and for um, the um, products, right, the, the, what they carry on the shelf. So they standardize what products they carry on the shelf um, in all their stores as much as possible. But it's everyday low price and they try to have these rollbacks. So after the product is in the store for a year, then next year they want to sell it for less. So maybe the first year that they have the product in the store, they sell it for $3.97. Next year, they want to be able to <coughs> sell the product for three forty eight and then the year after that three twenty seven. That's known as rollbacks. And so the promise is that they continue to reduce the price paid to the consumer on an ongoing basis. In fact, um, they talk about, often they caution us to watch for falling prices. You ever see some of their commercials? Watch for falling prices. And that's what the rollbacks are about. That's an important part of their retail strategy. And they expect customers are going to look for rollbacks, price reductions. But that's different from department stores. Department stores are known as high-low retailers. They're not everyday low price. They're high. Their prices are high and they have sales often. Very often. So they have sales um, very frequently. TPR. Yeah, they are a type of a TPR, temporary price reduction. Because after the sale is over, Right? They say, come in, the sale is 50% off, and then um, that's for, sometimes they have it as a one-day sale. So Jacob is saying, yeah, it's like this, you have this TPR, temporary price reduction, 50% off on Wednesday, and then, yeah, yeah, they have a sale for everything. Columbus Day, President's Day. Any excuse for a sale. And so we refer to that as high-low retailers. When do you think they do the most of their volume, the most of their uh, uh, revenue? Uh, Christmas. Uh, fourth quarter. Yeah, certainly for most retailers, the fourth quarter is important and when they have the sales. So definitely they drive a lot of foot traffic when they advertise that they're having a sale and they send um, their um, promotional material, whether it's a postcard or a catalog, in, right? They send that to your home, and that drives a lot of traffic to the store, and it generates a significant amount of sales. So some examples of department stores would be what? What would be some examples of department stores? Some Macy's. Sears. Sears. Wow. That's interesting. Hold that thought. Then is that not a retailer? It is a retailer. Well, yeah, it is a retailer. But let, let, let me come back to that. Because Sears, we would actually describe Sears as a general merchandiser. Now, Sears, 30 years ago, was the nation's largest retailer in the United States. But we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. But there we would classify them as a 
general merchandiser as opposed to a department store. So would Nordstrom's also fall, fall in that same category? Or is that the same category as Sears? Yeah. Shh, don't say that. Or Saks Fifth Avenue. No. no. <laughs> oh, no, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Saks Fifth Avenue, Macy's, Lord and Taylor, Nordstrom's, Neiman Marcus, Bloomingdale's, those are all department stores. Yeah, those are all examples of department stores, and certainly some department stores sell pro uh, merchandise at a higher price than others. So, Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom's, those um, are at a higher end, Bloomingdale, Saks, also. But um, they're um, part of the, we didn't, we didn't talk about, well, yeah, we did. We talked about the fact that um, department stores, besides very often having this high-low pricing strategy, that they have a variety of departments. So they have a lot of different departments, thus their name. Department stores, that classification. Why? Because they have a shoe department. They have a watch department. They have a cosmetics department. They have a bedding department. They have all these departments within the store. So they have something. They have something in a lot of different departments. But that's different from a specialty store. What's the difference between a department store and a specialty store? Because a specialty store might also sell sneakers and Macy's sells sneakers, but what's the difference? What's the difference between Macy's selling sneakers and a specialty store selling sneakers? That the specialty stores just sell sneakers? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the specialty stores have a narrow focus. They have a narrow focus, but they have a wide assortment. They have breadth. So sure, you could get sneakers at Macy's, but Macy's, although Macy's is a part of our life, you know, right? You're familiar with Macy's advertising? Macy's, we're a part of your life. You want me to sing the first song? La, 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 la. So, at Foot Locker, for example, they have a lot of sneakers. Macy's has um, quite a few sneakers there, too. You can get nice sneakers at Macy's, but at Foot Locker, they have a lot of sneakers, a lot of different kinds of sneakers, a lot of different brands, a lot of different styles. Hundreds, right? If you look at the number of SKUs, the number of stock keeping units, they have a very wide variety. Their assortment is very large. And it's usually newer, no? <laughs> um, Foot Locker, they'll have newer sneakers, and like Macy's will have like maybe last year's, no? Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's, that's not something that um, I'm sure Macy's would agree to. Um, as a department store, I'm sure they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be happy about that, but what happened <laughs> is reality. No, we, as, as marketers, we need to manage these channels. So, they, what we might have done is given re, uh, Macy's uh, an assortment of sneakers that other retailers don't have. So even if we don't give a retailer an exclusive on a product, we could still right on a product line, we could still give them an exclusive on an item. So you might be the only one that has that sneaker in orange. So that's, that's very possible. 
So of course, what we're trying to do as marketers is differentiate the assortment that's carried at different retailers in different channels. One of the challenges that we face, for example, if we carry, um, we ask Walmart to carry our product, is that Walmart could sell the product at a much lower price than other retailers. So if that's the case, well then how are you going to sell that at Macy's? How could you sell that same product at Best Buy? That's embarrassing to somebody to come in there and say, well, I saw this at um, Walmart, it's $20 less. That's not funny. That's like really embarrassing that people think, well, you've over, you're overcharging them. But what marketers do is work really hard to differentiate the assortment. So to make the item unique. So the item, especially that Walmart has, you want to be a unique SKU. Whatever that means, unique color, unique configuration, unique features, so that other retailers are not going to be embarrassed. Because there's no way that they could sell the product at the same price as Walmart. So if they are going to carry it at Macy's, then it's got to be with more features, more benefits, so that Macy's can say, well, it's not the identical product. Of course, it's a, right, whatever the product type is. Yes, it is a sneaker, it is a MP3 player, but this particular item has these features that the Walmart product doesn't. That's our responsibility as marketers to make that happen. Because when you go to to Best Buy, when you go to whoever the, um, the retailer is, they're going to ask, well, what, what, is, um, what are you giving Walmart? Because they know that Walmart, not because of predatory pricing, but because their cost structure, their operating expenses are so much lower than other retailers that they could buy it literally for the same price because the government says you have to sell um, the product for the same price, they could buy it for the same price and still sell it for less. So they require um, a smaller markup on the product. But if yours has less features, <clears throat> right, your item is unique, then you could charge a different price or if it's a different configuration. So for example, let's say that we're gonna sell plastic bowls, plastic storage bowls, plastic storage bowl that has a plastic lid. Now, if we sell that to um, Bed Bath & Beyond, for example, and they want us to Put it in a box, in a box that's going to hold eight, eight plastic containers because what we want to be able to ship is case pack and a half. So in other words, what we ship has got to be able to fit on the shelf. So if they require, let's say for the shipper, eight units with the label on it and the plastic lid snapped on, then we're going to charge them more than if we sell that product to, let's say, we need to mention dollar stores, let's say to Dollar General, where they don't require it to be eight in a box, but they'll take 50 in a carton, and we don't need to snap the lids on. So then we could charge Dollar General a lower price. Because as far as um, the government is concerned, right, we should be able to justify that our cost is different. Because now in the manufacturing facility, we don't have to pay somebody, otherwise we'd have to have another person on the line that's snapping the lids on the containers. They say, no, it's okay. Just send us 50 bowls and 50 lids. 
That's the way we're going to sell it. Let the customer, each bowl, grab a lid. So there's got to be differentiation. If there is differentiation, they could also, we could also charge a different price. So we talked about mass merchants, department stores. What about grocery stores? The largest grocer, the largest grocer in the United States, you're probably thinking, well, tell me some of the names of grocery stores that you're familiar with. Who could, tell me, who could raise your hand, tell me if you know. Go ahead, Jacob. Fairway. Fairway. Shoprite. Shoprite. Kroger. Kroger. Wegmans. Wegmans. Wegmans is nice. Publix. The Wegmans is a nice store. Publix. You could go in there, you'd probably think, oh, apples. You go into Wegmans, they have like 30 different kinds of apples. Who ever heard of such a thing, right? What giant? Pomegranate. Oh, it used to be you, Crawford. Pomegranate? Who said pomegranate? You know where pomegranate is on Coney Island Avenue? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Valley Park. Right. <laughs> That's right. Kroger. Yes, Kroger. Pathmark. What about uh, Pathmark? Albertsons? Whole Foods. Whole Foods. All of those, um, all of those are examples of grocery stores. None of them are the largest grocers in the United States. The largest grocer, not the traditional grocery store, not the largest traditional grocery store, the largest grocer is Walmart. Walmart sells more groceries, even though obviously they're not a grocery store, because they're a mass merchant, they sell more groceries than, um, than any other retailer, any other grocery store in the United States. So Kroger, Kroger is the largest traditional grocer. Kroger is the largest traditional grocer in the United States. Um, the tra largest traditional grocery store, I should say. Walmart is the largest grocer. What is it about um, grocery stores that's unique? Well, one of the things that does make them unique is the um, assortment that they carry. So their focus is on food. And, but they also have implemented what we call a scramble merchandising strategy, which means that they carry a variety of diverse products besides groceries. So you could even go into some of these grocery stores and buy a light bulb, a mop. Well, those are not groceries, but they, um, they sell them. What about drugstores? Walgreens. Walgreens. Rite Aid. Rite Aid. Rite Aid. CVS. CVS. Dwayne Reed. Dwayne Reed. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Those are all very well known um, drugstores. And Walmart and CVS are um, certainly the largest. They each, in terms of Um, the number of locations have increased very significantly um, in the last several years on a national basis. Dwayne Reed, certainly in a regional basis, we see like there in Manhattan there, like practically on every corner. Is that not so? And so they also have a scramble merchandising strategy, which, believe it or not, um, 25 years ago, that was not so common. They have, you could get laundry detergent, right? Shoelaces, just about anything in, um, in the uh, drugstores. Depending on the drugstore, some are larger than others. One of the things that, um, in fact, you might even almost say that uh, drugstores convenience stores, drug stores, convenience stores, dollar stores, specialty stores have a rather um, small format, if you will, compared to discount stores. So like Walmart, their 
um, super centers are about 200,000 square feet, which, to put it into perspective, is huge. <laughs> so 200,000 square feet is a big store. That's enormous. Um, some um, drug stores, uh, for example, and well, certainly convenience stores, you're talking about maybe 2,000 square feet. Some convenience stores absolutely um, are only 2,000 square feet compared to 200,000 square feet. Drug stores have actually increased in size um, quite a bit over the years, as we've seen as they brought in their assortment very substantially. So they're definitely not as small as convenience stores, but um, they're certainly not as big as um, mass merchants, as discount stores like Walmart or Kmart. Some of the, um, not all of the Target stores or the um, Kmart stores, Kmart refers to them, their superstores as um, Big K. They're not all um, 200,000 square feet. Some of them are a bit smaller, but still very significant. Very often, most of them are still around 150,000 square feet, which is very large. Specialty stores are also a fairly small uh, format. In fact, even, um, for example, a Foot Locker, not really much bigger than this room, would you say? I mean, they just have like wall-to-wall -wall sneakers. I mean, how many, um, it's probably bigger than your bedroom, but how, uh, I mean, how big do you think those, those stores are? I mean, what do you think the, the dimensions are? Good question. Um, is Home Depot a specialty store? Ah, Home Depot. So how would we, disc how would we classify Home Depot and Lowe's? What, what is a... Well, they used to be specialty, but so now they sell patio furniture and like it's a general home store, so they've expanded from home improvements, many new things. Yeah, and so, but you don't think that like the, yeah, so you're thinking more of like the construction aspect versus the fact that they sell furniture is less of a, furnishings is what you're saying, right? So they sell the furniture, the patio furniture, which is different from saying you're selling the bricks to put on the patio. Now they not only sell the bricks to put on the patio, they also sell the furniture, which is, um, you're saying it's like not construction. They it's also sell appliances. Yeah, they sell so like ovens and stuff. Right, so we could describe them as, um, as a general merchandiser, or generally they're still very often referred to as um, home improvement centers. Um, Home Depot has been very successful. In fact, um, to your point, they um, at some locations they even sell gas. So you could, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's right, Walmart too. Sam's Club sells gas. Yeah. So, Coach, is there a reason why Sam's Club their gas you don't have to be a, a member for? I'm not sure. I guess because they don't want that to be a barrier. To um, to customers, they figure well if you um, you know they they feel they might lose customers because of that. I mean, doesn't that go against their whole model? Yeah, I mean I'm not familiar with um, I never bought gas there. The cheapest. Yeah, I would I would that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what I mean I understand why they would do that, but you're right, it does go against their their business model. But do you think it's a good idea? No, I think it's terrible. <laughs> you, you think that it should only be um, to for their members. I see what the membership has its privileges that if you wanna get the gas at a discount. I think it takes off it takes off the members. But they they think about it, they can get more people. Right? People spend, people spend, you know, an annual fee to be member. It's like, a, it's like, but they use it like, someone can use yeah, it like a gas station, you know, like let's say someone's wrong, yes. Like stop and stand from a random person. It happens all the time to people. And it's so what different. happens when you go in there to pay, what do you think? Do you, do you think they try to sell you a membership? Yeah. When you go where? 
when you when you go to get gas at Sam's Club. They haven't tried to sell me. Man. They haven't. You've been there, and they, you go in there, and you're, you're not a member. Not they don't ask you for your card. They don't even ask you for your card, so it's like they don't. Yeah. And it's. Uh, I think someone said it may be like a like a like a legality issue that, according to, like, I don't know, standards, you're not allowed to. I guess not sell gas to some people. Oh, maybe that's well, interesting. Walmart does. No, hmm. I say I don't know that. Yeah, you don't. What um? <laughs> yeah, that may that that may be the case. That's, I'm I'm not aware of that, but there might be some um, some state or city um, regulation regarding that. I wonder. And it says Sam's Club, but when at the gas pump, it's like Sam's. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Do you think that, um, so what do you think about the idea that they charge a membership fee? You know, and it's like, it's not a little bit of money either. It's like $50, all based on the premise that what you buy here is going to be less, significantly less when you shop here. Your annual savings is going to be hundreds of dollars. And we just ask that, you know, in order to enable us to be able to do this, that, um, that you provide, that you pay a fee. You pay fifty dollars a year to be a member, because that's another example of um, exclusivity, a level of exclusivity where your customers are exclusive. And you might argue, well, what about if they didn't charge a fifty-dollar fee? Maybe they would have more customers. Maybe that would be better. But at this point, um, their strategy. Um, their strategy has, has not wavered. All right, so we talked about the different types of channels. We talked about the different um, retailers in those channels. Let's see if we could, uh, you want to see if we could get through this? Let's try and get through this. See if we have another, uh, we have what, another hour? Let's see if we can get through this. <laughs> Where's H? Let's see what we can get done. All right, so here we go. It says, two students, Nick and Lee, were studying for an upcoming exam in their introduction to marketing course. I don't have that sheet. While studying, because you came 20 minutes late, right? Yeah, right. right. While studying the chapter on marketing channels no, you did. <laughs> and wholesalers, Nick made the following statement. This one too. The following statement. If it weren't for wholesalers and other intermediaries in the channel of distribution, the products we buy would cost a lot less. What do you think about this? This is interesting. We, we talked about this when we talked about company-owned stores, selling through company-owned stores versus third-party distribution. So it says, if it weren't for wholesalers and other intermediaries in the channel of distribution, the products we buy would cost a lot less. After contemplating Nick's statement, Lee said, wait a minute, yeah, in between Barry's mumbling and, and murmuring, we learned in class that channel intermediaries actually make marketing more efficient by minimizing the number of transactions necessary to sell products. Lee's statement refers to what? The fact that A, value created, value is created by channel intermediaries. So what he was saying is really just dismissing the value that that intermediary in the value chain was providing. All intermediaries provide a certain function. Like for example, what is the function, what, are one, what is one of the key functions of a <coughs> distributor, for example, or, or a, a wholesaler? 
one of the main functions is that they break case packs. So if you order directly from the manufacturer, if your business is large enough that you could order directly from the manufacturer, well, they sell also in like what, you would, what we would consider to be bulk. If you buy from a wholesaler, you say, well, send me three. Well, they have a case that has 20 of them. So what they do is they send three to Isaac's shop, they send three to Jacob's shop, they send three to Noah's shop, and uh, Verbitsky, they send 10. Yes. Don't ask me why, but they do. So that's an important function. Now, of course, as a wholesaler, as a distributor, of course, you you make a certain amount of margin. And remember, when we talked about vertical integration, we said, why would a company like Kenneth Cole, for example, a designer, why would Kenneth Cole have 400 company-owned stores that sells their product and also sell in Macy's? Well, because they understand that Macy's is an intermediary, is the retailer. Macy's is an intermediary. Macy's is earning margin. And they're entitled to earn margin. But if you have your own company-owned store, then Kenneth Cole is earning the margin of the retailer and also the manufacturer as the designer. So it makes sense for them to want to vertically integrate. That's why companies vertically integrate. They want to be more profitable, more efficient. So in that case, they're not only manufacturing the shoes, the clothing, but they're also selling them. Horizontal integration would be if you're a specialty store. Let's say your organization is a specialty store. You sell sneakers. But if you also open up a specialty store that sells kitchenware, and then you open up a specialty store that sells clothing. And you open up a specialty store that sells electronics. That's an example of horizontal integration. Because why? Your business is retailing. If you're expanding that way, then you're opening up all these different types of retail shops, these different types of specialty stores. We call that horizontal integration. Vertical integration means that we're not only the retailer, but we're the manufacturer, maybe the processor, etc. All right, so we'll continue next time. Good job. You guys rock. Yes. Orange juice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure.